Oswai Thurpauv, and thank you all for joining me for this evening's talk on Cumbria and Newte. I'm aware that this is a bit of a different take on our historic built environment that perhaps our regular audience are used to seeing from the Royal Commission. And this is the project that marks the first significant step in our work on recording and understanding the built environment of the 20th century in Wales, a subject which has received little attention by the heritage sector until recently, a situation that we as an organisation are currently trying to rectify. This talk is based on a characterisation report produced by the Royal Commission, now available as a free digital download on our website with the aim of providing a foundation of understanding for a town with a unique history in Wales, but which until now has had little consideration in terms of its heritage value. The report very positively was initially suggested in conversation with staff at the planning department at Torvine County Borough Council, who had had concerns about the erosion of character of a town, which had seen very little attention from the heritage sector and about which there was very little understanding. The report therefore aims to provide an outline of the history and context of designation and development of the new town, together with an assessment of both its overall character and key sites and buildings, in the hope that this will start bigger and ongoing conversations about the value of these tangible and intangible assets today, their preservation and conservation, together with thoughts about what's appropriate in terms of new development in the town. I also hope that it will spark a new era of interest and research. By definition, the report can't be a detailed history of everything by the Cumbria and Development Corporation. And I think what it does do is highlight that there's a wonderfully rich potential for further work, both by the Commission, but I hope by many others as well. It also aims to put Cumbria on the map in relation to the other new towns of the UK, which have received increasing attention from both heritage specialists and built environment professionals but with Cumbria often missing from the discussions or consigned just to a list of other new towns. And so again, I hope that this report will prompt more understanding of and interest in Cumbria from outside of Wales. Finally, before my visit with Torvine County Borough Council in 2018, I've got to admit that I've never been to Cumbria before. As someone who'd grown up in mid Wales and has spent a good deal of my adult life back here as well, I'd just never had a specific reason to go to Cumbria, but equally hadn't ever really seen it as somewhere just to visit for the sake of it, a situation I probably share with a lot of people in Wales. Cumbria, while it's an extremely successful shopping destination, has that slight image problem that's shared with all the other UK new towns, that it's probably going to be a soulless, gloomy place lacking in character. There are many discussions to be had about the new town ideal and how successfully or not it was delivered for the residents of these towns, which there are people much more qualified than me to have. But what I do want is for the report to help celebrate the vision of the Cumbria Development Corporation in striving to fulfil a new town ideal of a better life for all, as well as celebrate the fascinating and very attractive modern day town that I found and want to encourage everybody else to go and experience for themselves. So very briefly, what was the new town ideal and where did it begin? For the origin of new towns, we have to go back to the 19th century and the rapid urbanisation resulting from the Industrial Revolution. The unprecedented influx of industrial workers to Britain's towns and cities caused a situation of overcrowded homes with inadequate facilities, quickly leading to conditions that appalled contemporary commentators. Although there were a handful of notable examples by individual industrialists to improve the living conditions of their workers, such as Saltaire near Bradford, built through the third quarter of the 19th century by Bradford textile industrialist Titus Salt, Port Sunlight, developed on the Wirral by William Lever from 1888, and Bourneville, built by the Cadbury's from the early 1890s. In 1898, urban planner Ebenezer Howard published his influential Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform, republished in 1902 as Garden Cities of Tomorrow, in which he discussed how the best of town, society, job opportunities and higher wages could be combined with the best elements of the countryside, nature, fresh air and beauty, in a network of settlements that provided for socially just and physically healthy societies 
through the provision of good jobs, high quality housing and open green spaces. With Howard's formation of the Garden Village Association in 1899, the first practical steps in the Garden Village movement were taken with the creation of Letchworth from 1903 and Welling Garden City from 1920. In Wales, the idea of the Garden Village were implanted across the nation, most notably at Oakdale, Carfilly by the Tregega Iron and Coal Company in 1910, with the construction of 660 workers' houses, a hospital, a miners' institute and a hotel, and at Rubina near Cardiff, built as a cooperative settlement between 1912 and 1923 and designed by Letchworth planners Raymond Parker and Barry Unwin. Some of these ideals were implanted into UK planning after the First World War, with the Homes for Heroes campaign and the Tudor Walters Report and Addison Act of 1819 and 1919, sorry, 1918 and 1919 respectively which set new standards for local authority house building and led to the construction of many expansive, low density housing schemes in the interwar period. However, often the need to build quantity at great speed and low cost comprised the, comprised the ideals of the garden city movement. A new emphasis on the planning and the design of new settlements came with the Second World War, when as early as 1941, planners were discussing how best to achieve the rebuilding of Britain in the aftermath of war, particularly large urban centres which had been the focus of German bombing campaigns, and the opportunities that it offered in creating improved lives for the people of a modern Britain. In 1944, the Greater London Plan was published by Sir Patrick Abercrombie, which as well as outlining the plans for the reconstruction of central London, proposed eight satellite towns around the city to allow for the large scale relocation of people from the worst of the inner city slums. In 1945, Lewis Silkin was appointed as the first minister of town and country planning. John Reith was appointed as the head of a new towns committee the same year, and the following year, the New Towns Act was passed. This act enabled the designation of sites for new settlements by the state together with the appointment of new town development corporations with full developer rights to direct and accomplish the building of the towns. The new towns were seen as a key part of Labour's new welfare state, which alongside the NHS and state pensions were designed to abolish poverty and exploitation. 14 first generation or Mark I new towns were identified for construction. The eight around London, three in the north of England, two in Scotland and a single town in Wales. There would later be a second generation of new towns, as well as an expanded town programme, which included new town Montgomeryshire. And that brings us on to Cumbrian itself. The New Towns Committee focused its investigations for Wales on two areas in the eastern coal fields, central Glamorgan and east Monmouthshire. The decision to nominate the Cumbria and Pont Newydd area was based on a very different reasoning to the other UK new towns. While particularly the London new towns were intended to attract industry and its workers to them, this area was identified as somewhere that already had a great deal of industry, but where the workers were being forced to commute to considerable distances due to a lack of local housing and other facilities. From the late 16th century, the area had become an increasingly important centre of iron working, tin plate making and steel making, supported by the construction of the Monmouthshire Canal and the Brecknock and Abergavenny Canals in the late 18th century, together with the development of the Monmouthshire Eastern Valley Railway from 1845. The largest 19th century industrial works included Ed the Edlgan, the Tinawyd and the Avondale Tin Plate Works. Cumbrian Iron Works, the founding of which in 1847 led to the growth of brick making, lime kilns, quarrying, iron, iron ore mining and coal mining in the vicinity. The Patent Nut and Bolt Company bought in 1902 by Guest Keen Nettlefolds. The Cumbrian Chemical Company's Vitriol Works incorporated into ICI in 1926 and the Oakdale Wire Works. With the decline of heavy industry in the 1920s and 30s, the area was designated as a distressed area in 1934 under the Special Areas Act, 
leading to the establishment of the Pilkington Glass Factory, Girlings and Alpha Laval, and out of Pontypool British Nylon Spinners. Most importantly, the Western Biscuit Factory was founded in 1939, now Burton's Biscuits, ensuring the invention of the Jammy Dodger here in the 1960s, and where every single UK Jammy Dodger is still made, including the wagon wheel as well now, uh, which is reason enough in my mind for listing the entire town in itself. One threat to the location of the new town came from the new town's committee when they declared that the area was too drab. Although this was overcome quickly by an actual site visit by Lewis Silking, where he exclaimed that he found it a good deal more attractive than the committee imagined. And after a public inquiry in October 1949 raised no insurmountable objections, the Cumbrian new town designation order was formalised on the 4th of November 1949. On the 24th of November, the Cumbrian Development Corporation, the body responsible for building the new town, was established. So where did they start? Well, the same place where so many initiatives start, by paying a consultant to write a strategy document. At this time, the firm of Minaprié, Spenceley and McFarlane were one of the must-do planning consultants, having had a hand in the post-war planning of Worcester and Chelmsford and having recently created the master plan for Crawley. The strategic plan was published in 1951, detailing the different requirements for housing, industry, education, transport and open space, together with this really beautiful master map plotting the overall layout and key sites. The plan defined a town partially dictated by the valley topo topography, with the town centre and zoned areas of industry on the flat valley bottom, surrounded by a ring of seven residential neighbourhoods. The existing village of Pontnewith to the north gave its name to this neighbourhood, as did Croesacaliog village to the northwest, originally Croesacaliog north with Croesacaliog south, later named Llanaravan, and Oakville village to the southwest. The Coideva neighbourhood included the Coideva mill, St Dial's neighbourhood, the site of the St Dial's medieval chapel, and Green Meadow neighbourhood, the Green Meadow Farm and Woods. The central historic village of Cumbran, which means Valley of the Cray, gave, the name to, gave its name to the overall town. With this rather wonderful Development Corporation logo designed around it. Each residential area was planned on the neighbourhood unit system each designed to house between 3,600 and 6,700 people. These numbers were considered large enough to support a unit centre of shops, banks, schools and community halls at the heart of each neighbourhood that would provide convenient and easily walkable facilities for day-to-day -day use, but also small enough to allow people to get to know each other and to engender a sense of community and identity. Each neighbourhood could be bound by the major transport routes coming in and out of the town in each direction, ensuring the safety of walking routes within the neighbourhood, as well as green open spaces providing opportunities for re recreation and relaxation close at hand for all. The original target for the Development Corporation was a town of 35,000 people to be reached over 15 years. As development got underway, the target population rose first to 45,000 and then in 1961 to 55,000. At that point, the CDC argued that to accomplish this number, extra land was required, and in 1977, a further 464 acres was added to the designated area around Henslees. Obviously, the biggest focus for building by the CDC was homes, building over 10,000 houses, flats and bungalows during its lifespan, and it's where the CDC started work immediately. Some local authority housing schemes had been built, with others under construction within the designated area, both by the Cumbrian Urban District Council and the Pontypool Rural District Council, and initially there was some slight tussling as to who had precedence over these. The first full CDC developed scheme, however, was T. Newith in the Pont Newith neighbourhood, planned so quickly in 1950 that the CDC still hadn't appointed a chief architect, and so Minaprio and Spenceley were asked to design the scheme. 
The result was not overly ambitious in terms of house design and closely followed the Ministry of Health and Works housing manual that was used for, that was used for local authority housing at the time. It is vaguely reminiscent of the garden village movement in its planning, however, with semi-detached white rendered houses set along a curving avenue with short offset cul-de-sacs and a village green. And the importance of the sense of space is emphasised by wide grassy verges and the planting of trees and hedges. With a target to complete 400 homes a year, much of the early CDC housing stock in the first neighbourhoods of Pont Newydd, Croesachalog, Llanaraven and Oakfield carried on in a similar vein, leading to some criticism of the first chief architect, JCP West, that he had allowed the urgency for housing to override some of his views on aesthetics. Although the attention paid to small details such as the variation in porch design and material added an often pleasing level of variety. An attempt at a technological, if not an aesthetic innovation, was made in 1952, when the New Towns Committee tasked Cumbrian, along with Harlow, Peterley and Basingstoke, to trial new housing building techniques to minimise the use of softwood, which was in severe shortage after the war. Two experimental terraces were built on Maindy Way, one trialling a series of different replacement materials, including hardwood, earthenware blocks and bitumen roofs, the second almost entirely of concrete construction, including the window frames and skirting boards. The feedback for both sets was generally positive, the residents more perturbed by the newfangled notion of a through living room as opposed to traditional parlour and back room than they were by the concrete window frames. One section of the town which was set aside for more considered aesthetic treatment was around Crown Road in Llanaraven. An area of sloping wooded ground on the west facing valley side, it was considered as one of the most naturally attractive parts of the designated area, with magnificent views over the valley, as well as being very visible from the town centre. As a result, higher quality housing for both rental and sale was developed by the CDC with larger detached properties with a greater variety of plan types and qualities of finishes. Several plots were also made available for private development, one of the most successful groupings being along Cardleon Road in Brynfredin, developed from the 1960s onwards. Another notable exception to these early developments were Northville and Southville, two smaller schemes bounding the town centre to the north and south and designed to be deliberately more urban in character, forming an intermediary with the suburbs. Both provided a much higher density of development with a greater focus on flats and masonettes with shared open spaces. At Southville, this emphasis on medium rise was increased, with four large blocks of flats along St David's Road, the main entry to the town centre from the south, planned as a visible statement that you were entering Cumbrian Centre. In 1962, West was replaced as chief architect by the younger and more radical Gordon Redfern, and from this point the housing developments got a substantial overhaul. One of the issues the CDC had been struggling with was the growth in car ownership, and Redfern introduced Radburn Planning, a US developed system for combining higher density housing with greater provision for car use and parking while segregating access for cars from pedestrians through the creation of separate networks of roads and footpaths to retain greater safety, ensuring that mothers and children could navigate a neighbourhood without having to cross a single road. As his schemes progressed into some of the steeper valley sides, he adapted the Radburn system to the tightly packed short terraces and courts that could work with the contours and maximise both the views and the light for the inhabitants. He also radically altered the design of the houses to break away from the traditional form associated with local authority housing, introducing a variety of roof lines, an increased range of external finishes to include prefabricated panels of stone and timber, contrasting with a range of rendered and exposed brick elevations, together with differing arrangements of fenestrations that all combine to provide an often austere but pleasing new aesthetic. 
Redfern also increased the percentage of medium rise blocks of flats around the unit centres. In the town centre, he was responsible for the seven storey Monmouth House, a mixed development of ground floor shops with luxury flats above, opened to great acclaim by James Callaghan in 1967, together with Cumbrian's only high rise, the Tower, both of which were an attempt to bring more life to the centre at night. Schools were also required rapidly. While there were a small number of junior schools in the designated area, there was no provision for secondary education, and the designation in 1949 highlighted the fact that a national programme for school building, initiated by the 1944 Education Act, had yet to be rolled out in this area. Responsibility for the design and build of schools in the new town stayed with Monmouthshire County Council as the local education authority, but close cooperation was developed between them and the CDC to provide a coordinated and strategic response to school building that provided more than 10,400 new school spaces. Many of the early schools were designed directly by the Monmouthshire's architect department, Monmouthshire's architect department, led by Colin Jones. He used the opportunity to create a county style that was used for primary and secondary level schools. One of the most prestigious educational projects was the Croesacalial campus, planned as two single sex grammar schools, a secondary modern school and a technical school, all on a single site chosen for its healthy isolation from railways and industrial zones. Only a co-ed grammar and the secondary modern of this ambitious scheme were finally built. But on opening in 1959, the grammar was described as one of the best equipped schools built by any authority in England and Wales since the war. The buildings were an exemplar of Collins, Colin James's county style. Expansive two-storey blocks of caramel brickwork, broken up with horizontal bands of glazing and copper reeds, and together with a trademark vertical element in the form of a clock tower. The grammar and secondary modern merged in 1971 to form the Croesacalio Comprehensive School. But sadly, both this complex and Clantarnham High School, the first secondary school built by the partnership, have been demolished and replaced in recent years. While the secondary schools were designed to sit between and to be shared by a number of neighbourhoods, the principle was to have a network of infant and junior schools that were located as close as possible to the unit centre, supporting the centre as a focal point for each neighbourhood, providing some architectural gravitas, as well as making it as easy and practical as possible for mothers to combine the school run with their daily shop. One of the best remaining examples of the early county style schools can now be found at Mount Pleasant Primary School, Pont Newydd, opened in 1955. A move away from the county style occurred at both levels of education in the 1970s. Fairwater Comprehensive by the replacement county architect Sidney Lation and Woodland Junior and Infant School by the private practice of Stephen Thomas of Newport both represent a marked change to more compact layout that were more inward looking. This corresponded to an extent with a shift in the use of schools for adult education. The CDC had seen the provision of adult education as equally important to formal education from the go, providing opportunities for residents to enrich their spare time with a range of academic and practical evening lessons, as well as providing opportunities for people, providing opportunities for people to meet and help engender that sense of community. The schools were always intended to be multi-purpose with classrooms and sports facilities at the disposal of the community outside of school hours. Though in a limited number of cases, including at Croesacalion, specific adult education wings were built to accommodate the classes. As time went on, the numbers attending dropped off with a change in demographic and an increase in alternative recreational facilities and entertainments. And by the 1970s, these classes were seen as quite old fashioned. One of the most important non-work activities for the success of the new town was retail. Cumbrand's proximity to the city of Newport and to Pontypool, a regional centre, was initially seen as an inhibitor to the ambitions of the town centre with the idea that it couldn't, and perhaps shouldn't, provide competition for these existing centres of retail. 
Initial focus was instead placed on the daily needs of the residents. The use of the neighbourhood system in Cumbrian ensured that residents of each area had easy access to this small central unit centre for their daily shopping needs. West took the approach that these centres should be appropriate in scale and design to the residential areas, stating in relation to the single storey complex at Mainde, which has now been demolished, that a more imposing architecture may, in such a small and compact scheme, lead to monumentality with a solid and rather crushing effect instead of the intimate and cosy atmosphere we are trying to create. And instead, he preferred to create a village centre feel through the building of a green and the planting of trees. With the expansion of the designated area in 1961 to the southwest, one central large unit centre was planned by Gordon Redfern to serve the number of smaller neighbourhoods created, supported by a network of individual pantry shops. This centre, the Fairwater Centre, was more ambitious in both scale and design, containing 18 shops, a health centre, dental practice, public house and a community centre. Redfern declared that a retail centre in this location had to be carefully designed to combat what he saw as the exposed nature of the site with exceedingly high levels of rainfall. His solution was a ring of high-sided units forming an enclosed space that he declared would physically and mentally shield shoppers during their visits. Protection from the elements was increased by the setting back of the shop fronts at ground floor level to provide a deep canopy. The central area, which was visible from all the shops, was furnished with the children's play area, making the shopping experience more enjoyable for children and their mothers. The centre today, which could be a model for sustainable car-free local shopping, is sadly underutilised and its future seems uncertain. JCP West was far more ambitious with his designs for the town centre shopping than he was with his unit centres. To compete with Newport and Pontypool, he predicted that Cumbrian needed to offer new and innovative experiences and veered away from the traditional high street Minaprio had suggested to design one of the UK's first pedestrianised centres, contemporary with those being developed at Coventry and Stevenage at the same date. Submitted in 1953, the Ministry Architects labelled it as one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting, new town centre schemes we have had. The layout was predicated on a north-south north central spine of shops that would ensure an equal provision of sunshine throughout the day, with a square at either end for the holding of events and celebrations. Although there have been recent additions to the fringes of the centre and many of the shop frontages have been modernised, the overall design of the centre is intact with its long, low, horizontal lines of shops punctuated by the vertical heights of key developments focused around the northern and southern squares. In the 1980s, projects were put forward to relieve what was described as the relentlessly flat skylines and stubby towers through the addition of copper domes and spires together with a statue of Bran at a cost of some £52,000, the scheme for which, perhaps thankfully, the funding was not forthcoming. The same scheme aimed to liven up the town centre by covering the tower in a network of 4,000 computer controlled lights, programmed to run in an infinite number of patterns, for which I'm sure the residents are very grateful that it never happened. Much of the detailed design work and build for these larger landmark schemes was in the end carried out by Gordon Redfern who completed schemes such as the David Evans department store, the first department store to open in the town in 1964, and with a remarkable design which, with external vertical timber cladding, which survived into 2021 in an unaltered state, although it's now currently undergoing refurbishment. Gwent Square was also the location of the Congress Theatre, opened in 1972 and an unashamedly modernist concrete structure of a style contemporaneous with the likes of Theatre Warren Aberystwyth and Theatre Ardavu Harlech. 
The facade of the Congress did not escape the 1980s desire to soften what they saw as the stark lines of the town centre, however, with the exterior rendered in colour washed in 1982 and the addition of the somewhat incongruous for a modern new town, figures of Diana Mavanoy by artist Polly Hope. The southern part of the town centre was originally set aside for a civic square, the detailed plans for which were discussed for many years with little headway. Various schemes included a hall of culture, public swimming baths, hotels, and even a 1979 Norman Foster designed open house community project, which included a national, sc national scale skating rinks amongst other facilities. But funding proved, funding proved a limiting factor in each case. More success came with a civic building which was never envisaged in the strategic plan, the new County Hall. The search for a site to replace the 1889 County Hall in Newport had been underway before the designation of Cumbran New Town, and as early as 1951, Monmouthshire County Council were assessing sites in Cumbran, with a request for land at Llanvrechwa made the following year. In 1955, they were back to assessing land in Croeser Ceilog, and perpetually indecisive, returned in 1962. With the run up to the 1972 Local Government Act on the horizon and increased numbers of staffing needed, a decision was finally made on the site between Chrysler Kaliog and Llanar Avon. Designed by the practice of RMJM, it was constructed between 1969 and 1977, and from 1974 was occupied by the newly formed Gwent County Council. Formed of an interconnected office range and council chamber block, the imposing building with its bands of bronzed glass windows interspersed with dark exposed aggregate concrete panels and terraced walkways, this was considered by many to be the finest of the handful of new county halls built in Wales. Its demolition in 2013 recognised as one of the many regrettable losses of post-war civic design across the nation. Despite pockets of concentrated industry, most of the designated area was open agricultural land and woods, with many of the boundaries and names being able to be charted back to the Llantarn and Priory, a 12th century daughter foundation of Strata Florida. The master plan emphasised the retention of historic woodlands, in particular as areas to donate, donate the separation of the neighbourhoods, to provide recreational facilities as well as retaining elements of a pre-Newtown character on a small scale within the neighbourhoods, such as at the Oakdale, <coughs> sorry, the Oakfield Unit Centre, where development was focused around a set of particularly fine large trees retained in the centre. The CDC would put considerable effort into the creation of sporting and recreational parks. 22 hectares were assigned for formal sports centres and industrial playing fields, including the Cumbran Stadium, which completed in 1973 and opened by football legend Brian Clough, provided an international standard athletic track that later catapulted Colin Jackson to world champion and Olympic medal success, playing fields and a sports centre, while neighbourhood playing fields, playgrounds and tod lots were assigned at 3.5 acres per thousand of population. They also embarked on a, on a major planting scheme across the town, and by March 1988 had planted a total of 40,557 trees and 699,097 shrubs. The most ambitious public park created was the Crow Valley Recreational Ground, Llanar Avon. 57 hectares containing a baiting lake, tea rooms, ponds, play areas, a golf course and a community sports facility, all among extensive planting of trees and shrubs and described by locals to be an oasis in the middle of town. At the very heart of the urban centre, the water gardens were designed by Gordon Redfern as a key visual and recreational space for socialisation and a welcome area for busy shoppers to relax. His design focused on the combination of different textures in the form of hard landscaping and planting, with a sense of movement and sound created by running water. At the upper end, at ground level, was a more formal layout of a pool, containing an installation created from the locally made Pulkington glass, 
fed by a substantial horizontal water jet that created a sense of energy, vitality, vitality and noise. The lower end fed the water via a small canal into the sunken area of the garden. Cascading as a waterfall down the southern retaining wall, the water highlighted a moulded geometric form and embedded glass patterns before coming to rest in a tranquil pool at the base. The remainder of the garden was planted with a variety of trees and shrubs, forming a quiet, relaxed area below the bustle of the shops. Although the water element isn't working anymore and access to the gardens has been restricted in recent years, there still seems to be a very well-loved space by locals, particularly those living in the centre. Sadly, however, the gardens have been approved for demolition and infill, and despite requests for listing by both the Commission and the 20th Century Society, it's felt that they don't meet, their cri meet the criteria for protection. And so it would seem this unique feature in Welsh town planning has little time left. The CDC was also an enthusiastic commissioner of public art as a way of enhancing the built environment and creating a sense of identity for the town. A number of smaller artworks were commissioned by the Cumbran Arts Trust, funded by the CDC, including Family Group by David Horn, which represents the building of new communities now located in the grounds of the Tlantarnum Arts Centre and sadly looking a little worse for wear. The two most significant works are both within the town centre. The first is in Gwent Square, the northernmost square within the town centre at the heart of Cumberland New Town. As such, it was the heart of various schemes by the CDC to create an identity, one of which was this set of three wonderful murals commissioned by the Arts Trust in 1974. Formed of moulded concrete, they were created by artists Henry Collins and Joyce Pallet and depict the phases of history of the county, Iron Age, Roman, Medieval and Industrial. Despite over 60 commissions produced by the couple, these beautiful concrete works depicting the scenes of a cultural and industrial past that are so typical of their work are currently the only piece attributed to the couple in Wales. The second is the striking lift shaft to Monmouth House, externally located on the facade overlooking the water gardens and adorned with a geometrically designed moulded concrete relief. This was commissioned by the CDC for the opening of the building in 1967 from renowned post-war artist William Mitchell, who specialised in the large scale concrete murals and is a highly significant piece forming one of only two large scale work of his known to have been commissioned in Wales and the only one that we are certain survives. Smaller reliefs were created by Mitchell can also be seen on the sections of the rebetting walls to the A4051 Cumberan Road. For those of us who know Wales well, it's perhaps unsurprising that there was already wide ranging and plentiful provision for Christian worship within the area. In addition to the medieval St Michael's and All Angels and the 19th century St Gabriel's and Trinity Anglican Church and Our Lady of the Angels Catholic Church, there were more than 15 nonconformist chapels of independent Baptist, Calvinistic Methodist, Primitive Methodist, Wesleyan Methodist and Salvation Army causes. No wonder that Eva Bulmer Thomas, the Cumbran native, was later in life inspired to establish the Friends of Friendless Churches. New town foundations were therefore relatively few, with the Wesleyan Methodists most proactive in founding new chapels to serve the new neighbourhoods. Llanar Avon Wesleyan Methodist Chapel was designed in 1959 by W. H. Cripps of Oxford. The church site committee requested the original designs be altered to their own specifications, before finally deciding that the result was far less attractive than the original and approving his original designs. As noted in the introductory part of the talk, the designated area also contains substantial amounts of industry and Cumbran Development Corporation was perhaps unique in initially having a moratorium on new industry establishing themselves in the town, although existing industries were encouraged to expand with some significant buildings such as the Girling Engineering School by Cl Clifford T. and Gale in 1958-59. Throughout the 1960s, the CDC was successful in attracting a more representative balance of service and light industries, 
through its creation of a number of industrial parks and its policy of building a range of advanced factories. After the building of the M4 and the Severn Bridge opened in 1969, the locational advantage of Cumbran boosted its attractiveness to industry substantially, with Renishaw, Hoffman Engineering and Nimbus Records all investing heavily in the town. Two of the most notable builds were for, for Ferranti Computers, later GEC Marconi, designed in 1980 by Russell after leaving the CDC and combining offices and lecture theatres, computer and amenity facilities. Together with the Alpha Laval factory of 1973 by Keith Mainstone of the Percy Thomas Partnership, now extended and home to festive productions, the UK's number one tinsel producer, manufacturing 14 million metres a year, alongside over 8,000 other Christmas products, and so just a gratuitous opportunity to insert a little bit of sparkle into what is supposed to be, after all, a Christmas lecture. Perhaps the CDC's biggest industrial success, however, was an early and decisive move to attract the high-tech market with the development of the Llantarnam Business Park from 1981. The grouping of Raglan House, Brecon House, Tigwent, Tinton House and Avon House represented the move to attract a more specialised industry that was accompanied by an executive hotel development and attractive landscaping. By the mid-1980s, although the target of 55,000 people hadn't been reached, it was decided that the Cumbrian Development Corporation had fulfilled its remit, and on the 31st of March 1988, it was wound up. Some major assets, such as the shopping centre, were sold in private hands, while others were transferred to local government organisations. So where does that leave Cumbrian today? Inevitably, in the 30 plus years since the CDC was wound up, there have been alterations and additions to any of the buildings. And as we have seen, some significant losses with more on the horizon. And green spaces in particular are starting to be eroded. Despite this, much remains intact. And the character of the new town as envisaged by the CDC is certainly fundamentally still there. However, only one element of the new town has so far been listed a sign for one of the industrial estates, and there are no conservation areas. And so thought does need to be given very quickly about how to protect what remains. And this is where I hope the report we've written that does give a lot more detail than I've been able to cover this evening will be useful. Lewis Silkin in his foreword to the New Town Act said, the building of a new town is not merely a great task of physical construction. It is also a great adventure in social construction for the new towns must be lively communities with their own civic consciousness and civic pride. Despite the lack of interest that's generally been shown in Cumbran, we can now recognise it as a unique and highly important example of post-war town planning in Wales, equal to any of the other UK new towns. And the commitment of the CDC in creating innovative and efficient housing, generous green spaces, community development, arts provision for all, civic provision and employment opportunities can still be strongly charted through the built environment of Cumbran as it survives today. So perhaps now is the time for us all to start taking a little bit more pride in that as part of our nation's heritage. I'm aware that I've been talking for quite a long time now uh, and I hope that some of you at least are still with me. Just as a, a very last thing, I need to thank both the staff of the Gwent Archives and Torvine Museum for all their help in accessing what is an absolute wealth of archive material and allowing me to use all the wonderful archive images you've seen this evening. I also have to thank the staff at Torvine for prompting this project in the first place and for their support during the project. I'm sure there are lots of you listening who have much more detailed information about the sites in Cumbran and the history of the Development Corporation. I'm aware that there are still a lot of people living in Cumbran who are involved in many of these projects. Unfortunately, this project took place almost entirely during lockdown, and so much of the work planned of engaging with people in the town wasn't able to take place. My email is up here if anybody would like to contact me. We would very much like to hear from you. Otherwise, I will try and answer a few questions if there are any, and otherwise, many thanks for listening.
Thank you.